Hello, I hope you're well. Welcome or welcome back to my channel and welcome to today's video where I gush about the best books of 2022 so far. So first off, I just want to say this is not going to be my forever filming backdrop, but I'm not setting up my office slash library until this weekend. So bear with me, there are no books in the background. In fact, all of my books are still in boxes. Anywho, I am very excited about today's video because I'm talking about those books that have been living like rent free in my brain since I read them earlier this year. It has been a bit of an odd duck as far as my like reading journey so far. I have not read anywhere near as many books as I would have anticipated by July of 2022. In fact, I think I'm like nine or ten books behind schedule um, and probably because of that, having read fewer books, I don't have as many five star reads either as I would normally anticipate. I think it's partly because of that, but I think it's also because I started using the story graph and so I'm taking advantage of those, faction, those fractional ratings and maybe not being quite so liberal with that holy grail five star as I would if I was using Goodreads or something like that. But regardless, there are some fabulous books that I have read, so I'm going to talk to you about them. I have six books total. Yes, I would really like to talk about ten, but to be honest, there were not ten books that were completely mind-blowing to me or like fantastic reads. That would be saying that one third of what I've read is up there and it's just not true. So we're going to go with six and those are the six books that have had the most impact on me. So why don't we dive right in? The first book that I want to talk about is not a traditional pick and that's because it's a play. I'm talking about Lungs by Duncan McMillan which I really enjoyed. I saw a virtual production of this during the pandemic in 2020 and knew I had to get my hands on the actual play itself and read it. And I was not disappointed whatsoever. The play Lungs is about this couple. Sorry if the light dips in and out, guys. I will try to fix it in, um, in post production. But this couple in this play, I would say they are millennials, are contemplating their future and they're contemplating whether or not they should have a child and whether it is the right thing to do or the responsible thing to do given the kind of state of the world, global warming, um, wars, poverty, population, overpopulation, um, they start really looking at the sort of existential crises of the time and start really contemplating if they should even have a child and bring them into the mess that the world has made of itself. And it is a play that really resonated with me because I know I have had those thoughts um, in recent years, and I know friends of mine who, who have had similar thoughts, but this is a play that if you actually look at the text itself, it kind of looks like a poem, like a very, very long poem, how it's broken up, and that's because there's very little direction. Everything is kind of sparse, and these characters are just talking rapidly a la like Gilmore Girls scripts, which were reportedly longer, like pages longer than a normal hour long sitcom because of how fast those characters talked. Like these characters are talking at a clip, they are interrupting each other, they are talking over each other. And you actually see that in the way that the book is written and the way that the play is kind of laid out for you. But it's interesting to see this couple talking about this coming to terms with their decision and how those decisions and everything impact their relationship as a whole. And it just feels like such a timely piece and such a relevant piece of literature 
that it's something that I continue to think about and really recommend to anyone who likes plays or wants to try their hand at sort of modern playwriting. Like it's, it's a gem. And so I loved it. And I'm really honestly looking forward to a reread or a rewatch of that production sometime soon. Next, I want to talk about a book that is so not on brand for me, but one that I can't stop thinking about, which is why I want to talk about it. It's The King of Infinite Space by Lindsay Fay. I spoke about this in my Mid-Year Freakout tag as one of the biggest surprises for me of 2022, and I stand by that. It is a contemporary book, which is usually not my cup of tea, with speculative kind of fantasy elements to it, which is also generally not my cup of tea, but it worked for me. <laughs> it really did. And I don't know if it's because it is an adaptation of Hamlet and I am a big Shakespeare nerd at my core, but it was just chef's kiss. I think I gave it four stars and honestly, it's a book that I keep thinking I probably should have given it five stars when I did read it, just because of how impactful the story is. It is, as I mentioned, a modern day retelling of Hamlet and it's set in New York City. It is a book that has LGBTQ plus representation. It addresses mental illness and mental health. It addresses neurodiversity and it is a feminist text as well. I would argue that given how much they talk it up as being a feminist text that I expected a little bit more feminism in it, but there is a little with the character of Ophelia, so I will give it that. But it's so interesting because even though you can very clearly tell that it is an adaptation of Hamlet, it has twists and turns that you would not expect. And so it makes it feel fresh and new and not just same old, same old. And I mean, most people are very familiar with Hamlet, even if only because they watched The Lion King when they were kids. Like, this is not the first time that Hamlet has been adapted, but it it's just, wonderful. And I think, too, one of the strengths of this book was really the characters. You have three POVs. You have the Horatio character, Ben, who is Hamlet, and then Leah, who is the Ophelia character. And you really get into their heads and really see how their minds operate differently, especially when it comes to Ben. He is the neurodiverse one in the group. And so seeing how his brain works and how he talks to people and how he just interacts with the world is really refreshing. But you also have some incredible banter between Ben and Horatio and the chemistry between them is just fabulous as well. So it really was a book that did a lot with the source material and really like shown like it was it was just a gem a treasure of a book so i would highly highly recommend that one as well moving on to the next two books we have brown girl brown stones by polly marshall which is a meaty modern classic that i really really enjoyed so the book is set during the Great Depression and World War II eras in Brooklyn. And it is a coming of age story for this character, Selena. She lives in a community of immigrants from Barbados. And she is kind of caught between both of her parents who have very different dreams and ambitions. And her mother is kind of the archetypal Barbadian immigrant who is ambitious and hardworking and aspires to own a home. 
She wants to buy a home. She wants to own a home. She doesn't want to rent anymore. Meanwhile, her husband, Dayton, Selena's father, is a little bit more kind of lackadaisical. Like they describe him as lazy and a dreamer and he really just envisions himself going back to the island and the island way of life. And she's caught in the middle of this conflict between these two very different ways of thinking and ways of living. But over the course of the book, you have Selena coming of age. And it is a book that really touches on a bunch of different subjects. You witness racism, but in this way that is really unique in that she's, Selena is in this really insulated Barbadian community. So when she goes out and experiences racism, it feels really jarring because for the most part, she's safe and secure within her community and doesn't experience it. But then you also have to keep in mind that these same immigrants from Barbados have created this association that is kind of like NAACP-ish. And, excuse me, and they don't want to let other West Indian Americans in. And they don't want to let Black Americans in. They just want it to be for their little group. So they wanted it to be rather exclusive. And so seeing how race plays a role in that and colorism and that sort of thing is really interesting. But it's also a book that, because it is a coming of age story, looks at Selena's sexuality and coming into her own as a woman and looks at womanhood and looks at motherhood with her very kind of fraught and complicated relationship with her mother, Scylla which is also really compelling. And then you just have like the American dream and really a close look at what that is in this time period and how the Great Depression and how the war and how home ownership and all of that play a part. And I mean, this was a book that I read at the very start of my own like house buying journey and as someone who is from, from a family of West Indians, it resonated with me. Like I know that drive, that ambition to own a home and how important that is because <laughs> it is something that I have witnessed in myself, in my father and his siblings, in his father, my grandfather, like that was the dream home ownership in the U.S. So it was definitely a book that resonated with me on a personal level, but it is also just jam-packed with so much fascinating information. And so even without that context, um, it's just a, a really, really great read. So it's I feel like it's one of those books, again, that it's a modern classic and needs to be talked about more, which is also why I'm so glad that it is one of my favorite books so far this year, because it deserves more of a platform. So I highly, highly recommend that as well. And I know that I'm going to say that a million times. So just blanket statement, all of these books are highly recommended by yours truly. Next up is A Girl is a Body of Water by Jennifer Nonsabuga Mukumbi. And straight off the bat, I just want to say that this is a very difficult book to describe because it is many, many things, including very beautiful. And it is a coming of age story of this character, Kiribu, who is growing up in a village in Uganda. And she is motherless and raised by her grandmother, her grandmother's best friend, who is this blind witch character, and her aunts. And it is a story that is truly centered around women and womanhood. And it's exploring Caribou's coming of age, coming into her sexuality, coming into her own womanness, for lack of a better term, over the course of this book, and really exploring the ways in which women 
function within this society. And it is a book that is strongly a feminist book. It really explores the strength of these women and their relationships with one another. They are at the forefront of this story. The male characters are very much secondary to their storylines, especially to Kiribu's. But there is also this folkloric element to it with talk of the first woman, who is this kind of energy, this force before mankind and like history kind of calls women to become more subservient and submissive just on the whole. Like these were the powerful women, the first women, and Kiribu is kind of posited as being one of these rare creatures who has survived and is a first woman today. And it's it's just spellbinding. There is a lot to this book. It is not a small book. I want to say that it's 400, 450 pages. Unfortunately, it's in a box currently, so I can't check. But it is a meaty book. But it didn't feel like it was in excess because there was just so much to explore with her relationship with the women in her life, with her quest to reconnect with her own mother, with her coming into her own personhood and just really, really grasping that. It was, it was phenomenal. Like it, it really, really was. Um, I would hesitate to call this historical fiction, um, even though it really addresses colonialism in Uganda and also mentions Idi Amin's regime. Those things are more coincidental to the book than anything else. The book is strongly character driven. And so while you do get mentions of some of that stuff, it really just does focus on Kiribu, her wife, and the family in and of itself. But yeah, it's it's a book that is really hard to put your finger on, but the writing is incredible. The characters are fascinating. And if you really want like a piece of literature that is like feminist, I would like th this is it, like pick up this book. So Next, we have Regeneration by Pat Barker, which is the first book in the Regeneration trilogy, which I've already finished this year. And it is a historical fiction trilogy set during World War I. It is very much an anti-war sort of book, really taking into account the suffering that war brings on not just the physical or visible signs of suffering, but the mental and emotional suffering. And it's really unlike anything else I've ever read on World War One. So the book is, this book in particular is focused around Craig's Lockhart War Hospital. And this is where soldiers who were on the front and have experienced shell shock are being sent to be treated by this doctor, William Rivers, who is meant to observe them, treat them, decide that they are quote unquote sane, and then send them back into the trenches to fight and possibly die. And over the course of the book, it starts raising questions about the like senselessness of the war and whether it's really worth it. And Dr. Rivers starts to seriously contemplate whether what he is doing is the right and moral thing to do. Like, should he be sending these men back potentially to their death? In true Pat Barker fashion, this is a book that has some beautiful, and I mean truly beautiful passages, but also passages that like just talk about human nature. And I know that's very woo-woo, but like it, like it's just so honest and true to like the human condition that they really do kind of leave you breathless and kind of, you need to sit for a moment and just like soak it all in. It is a book that is very, very frank. 
And that is also kind of very much in Pat Barker's fashion, from what I gather. She does not shy away from talking about sex and violence um, and just doing so in very like straightforward terms. So this is not going to be a book that I would say is for everyone, but it is a book that I think resonated with me on this emotional level because of how it looks at the different soldiers who are passing through this hospital. The main sort of soldier is Siegfried Sassoon and he is a poor poet and war hero and he is basically up for a court martial until like they decide maybe he's insane and so he ends up going to this hospital because they're trying not to court martial this this war hero who is now being very anti-war and talking about the pointlessness of it but the like actual emotional and mental toll that this war has had on them is very very present it it manifests itself in not just like the ways that i've commonly thought about it with like nightmares or anxiety like there are men who have gone mute like won't talk because of what they've witnessed and because of this PTSD. Um, it, there are men who are experiencing like actual paralysis with no physical symptoms that the doctors can see, but because of the toll mentally, that is how it's manifested. And it, it just, your heart bleeds for these men. It is not an easy read in that way, but I think that is truly the beauty of it. It's not glorifying war. It is not romanticizing it in any way. It's just the brutal truth in this very sort of beautiful literary take on it, if that makes sense. It might not, hopefully it does, but yes amazing and I've read the other two books in the series and highly recommend them. I really really enjoyed it. I am a Pat Barker stan so this book should not be a surprise for anyone. <laughs> and the last book is my favorite book of 2022 so far. I've spoken about it on this channel so many times already in my Q1 book bracket in my mid-year freak out tag in a vlog, I think, um, in that month's wrap up, like, you're just gonna keep hearing about this book because not only is it a favorite book of mine for this year, I'm pretty sure it's going to be one of my favorite books of all time if it isn't already. Now that I've given you all of that build up, the book is Moon Tiger by Penelope Lively which is a Booker Prize winner from the late 80s or early 90s. And it is this beautiful little book that is about this character, Claudia. She is an old woman on her deathbed and she's decided to recount the history of the world, but according to her and through the lens of her own life and you explore a set of relationships that have really helped to make her who she is, whether it's her relationship with her daughter, her relationship with her daughter's father, a relationship with the love of her life, the relationship with her brother. Like you get so much from seeing her interactions with those characters, but also on the backdrop of these major events in the first half of the 20th century, like World War II, like it's all there. And it's again, one of those books that like, it has some heartbreakingly beautiful passages and musings. And there are a couple sections that are like talking about like God and religion and history. And it's just, like, I, I can't get enough of this book, to be quite honest. And really, the star of the show is Claudia. She is this, like, whip-smart, 
very clever sort of egotistical character who is just vivacious and filled with life and energy and she her voice and the tone in which this like book of memory is like delivered it it's just such it was such a fun time like her voice her tone the authenticity of it I it really is just beautiful. I have gushed about it so many times on this channel and I know I've encouraged at least one of you to pick it up and give it, I think, a 4.25 ratings, which I, I will accept. Um, but yeah, that's by far been my favorite book so far of 2022, as you will have seen in that Q1 book bracket video. So yeah, but anyway, those are my favorite books of 2022 so far. I mean, these are books that I've been gushing about on my channel nonstop, so there are no surprises here, but I genuinely adore them and strongly encourage you to pick them up if any of them, like, pique your interest at all. But it will definitely be interesting to see how many of these books end up on my end of year favorite books of 2022 list. That's kind of the fun part of doing these videos is because things do change. So it's fun to look, kind of look retrospectively um, and see what books have been knocked off the list and by which ones. So that'll be a fun ride come December. But in any case, I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up comment and subscribe because all of those things help this little channel grow and they mean the world to me and we are so close to 1,000 subscribers guys we're like 50 away so <laughs> I would love you to subscribe and help me to hit that milestone but thank you so much for watching I will see you next time bye